Okay, welcome back to the Classics of Immunology Journal Club. So it's good to be back. And before we get started, let me uh, remind you to, on the YouTube site, uh, like the video, click on the bell, subscribe, check out my website, and click on the writing tab to get all the classic papers, including this one, and we're good to go. So this week's paper is from 2003, if you can believe that. And it's by Shohei Hori, Takashi Numuro, and Shimon Sakaguchi. And it came out in Science in February of 2003, titled Control of Regulatory T-Cell Development by the Transcription Factor, FOXP3. Now, the background on this book, um, you probably, in order to really get a good feeling for the background on this whole field of regulatory T-cells, you have to check out my book, Molecular Immunity, a chronology of 60 years of discoveries. And in this, um, I have a whole chapter on regulatory T cells, uh, in addition to the um, co-stimulatory and co-inhibitory molecules of the, of the uh, T cell uh, immune response. And so I really highly recommend that you check out this book and um, read these chapters if you're really interested in this, because it gets it gets complicated as I'll go into in this, in this particular paper. The history on this whole thing goes back to 1961, 62, Jacques Miller, uh, who was an Australian investigator working in London as a postdoc, um, who was trying to understand whether or not the thymus was involved uh, in, um, in immunity. And it was, it was a problem and a question because when people thymectomize adult mice, they could discern no difference in, in, the, um, uh, in the control mice versus the thymectomized mice. But um, um, Jacques Miller said to, said to himself, maybe, it's, maybe the thymus is important for development of the T cells um, or of lymphocytes. And so he, that, he waited until they were born uh, and then took those newborn mice, who were just tiny little things, and worked out a system to thymectomize them and um, let, them, let them grow up and studied them. Uh, and for the first month of life, four weeks or so, they looked perfectly normal, grew at a normal rate and, and so forth. Um, but then in the second month of life, they started to, to become sick and runted and um, they got, the fur got all scruffy and they didn't do well and so forth and so on. Now, to, he then did various immunological tests during the first month of life and found them to be immunodeficient. Um, and you need to read those papers and yeah, you can go on the, on the website to, to get them. And he focused on the immunodeficient first month, but, and he didn't really do much with the uh, second month of life of these animals. But, that's, but the second month is what this paper uh, is all about. Nothing ha happened throughout the 60s until the late 60s, 69, 70. And an investigator by the name of uh, Nishizuka uh, from uh, Japan um, started looking at this period of, of the um, neonatally thymectomized mice. And uh, he found that the, the mice, um, if left alone, would ultimately uh, develop organ-specific autoimmunity. And then a decade went by. In 1982, from 69, 70, 71 uh, to 82, uh, Sakaguchi, Shimon Sakaguchi was a young investigator in Kyoto University, and he, he took a sabbatical or a leave of absence and went to um, uh, Nishizuka's lab, and where he learned uh, all about this uh, autoimmune phenomenon that was happening in these mice. And he did a series of experiments whereby he tried to see whether or not he could reconstitute the um, immune responses of, of these mice and, and prevent the, the autoimmunity by uh, using um, uh, transplanted T cells. And for the most part, he could do that. But if, if he started then um, uh, fractionating the T cells that he was substituting in these mice, he found that he, um, uh, if he took out LYT1 positive cells, they were at the time, they were thought to be the helper T cell compartment. If he took those out, then 
uh, they, the mice uh, developed, still developed the autoimmune disease. And there were several you know, organ-specific autoimmune diseases, as well as systemic um, uh, autoimmune reactions, as well as inflammatory into external antigens, as well as internal antigens, self-antigens, such as um, gastritis and, um, and uh, ulcerative colitis. So the question is, what is going on with this thing? Now, these, these, whole, these investigators from Japan were really basically ignored by the Western world of immunology, and they didn't really pay much attention to them, as far as I can tell, uh, because they were the only ones working in the field. And it wasn't until 1991, now we've gone from 61 to 91, so we've gone through 30 years. And at that time, uh, Interleukin-2 entered the story, and Ivan Horak, who was an experimental pathologist from... Um, Würzburg University in Germany decided they wanted to make a knockout. Knockout mice had just been reported upon and dis discovered and reported upon. And so Ivan uh, went to a couple of his immunological collaborators uh, uh, at the university and asked him what he should knock out if, they, if he could. And they, they all said interleukin-2 seems to be a really important cytokine. It's a small molecule. They ought to be able to do it. Uh, from a genetic standpoint, duck soup. And so he knocked out the IL-2 gene and reported that in 1991. Everybody expected these mice to be totally immunodeficient um, because of all the work that my laboratory had done and others uh, showing how important IL-2 was for the T-cell and for the generation of a T-cell immune response. And the fact of the matter is, in the initial experiments that were published in, I think, Science or Nature in 1991, the, the mice were immunodeficient, but they weren't totally immunodeficient. immunodeficient. And so um, that was sort of strange uh, in terms of what the immunologic dogma were at the time. And Horak went, went further and, uh, and had a paper out in 93 and then another one in 95. We transferred the, the, um, the knockout gene onto a valve C background. And these mice um, got sick earlier than, um, than the, they were using an outbred strain before. So that by five weeks, there was 100% mortality. And what would happen to these mice? So within the first month, they would get sick. Like, and that wasn't like Jacques Miller's mice with a neonatal athemectomized that would wait until two months to get, <laughs> to get sick and die. Uh, but they, would, they had the same phenomena. They went, then they had this paradoxical situation of immunodeficiency and then superimposed on that uh, an autoimmune phenomenon with um, activated lymphocytes and in, in, infiltrating many, many different organs and so forth. The IL-2 knockout mice would succumb and die because they, they, um, they either got autoimmune hemolytic anemia so that they had essentially zero or very low red blood cells, or they um, would develop ulcerative colitis um, and, and they would succumb because of that. And we published a, a review article together in 1995, and 95 becomes a very critical year in immunology. Lots of things happened. We postulated, we, so we described our experiments, and, and I had collaborated with Ivan Hora um, to see whether or not if we could administer IL-2 and we could um, prevent the onset of this lethal disease, and we could. As long as we kept giving them IL-2, they didn't get it. And as soon as we stopped giving them IL-2, then they underwent an uh, an irrevocable uh, decline and uh, into death. And so one of the things that, that, um, that I had been wondering about throughout this time period between 1980 and 1990 um, was whether or not um, there was a, a negative feedback loop that was activated by IL-2 to turn off the, the IL-2 uh, stimulation of the, of the T cells and turn off their proliferation and it seems to me, it seemed to me that that's one of the possibilities that that was happening in this particular instance, that we were dealing with a situation whereby if we took a, a particular um, T cell away from uh, the, the developing uh, immune system, that these, the, that therefore they would lack the so-called suppressor or regulatory function that actually Sak Sakaguchi had postulated about back in uh, 10 years earlier in 1982. So then in 1995 was also, was also another series of experiments that were done on a, one of the co-inhibitory molecules called CTLA-4 that had been discovered uh, 10 or 15 years earlier. And, um, and both Arlene Sharp in Boston and, and Craig Thompson, uh, and as well as along with Tac Mac, 
they made uh, CTLA-4 knockout mice. And lo and behold, the CTLA-4 knockout mice had exactly the same syndrome of immunodeficiency and then superimposed on that an activated T cell uh, infiltration of all the major organs in the body. And they underwent a rapid downhill course and died within three or four weeks, essentially, in the CTLA-4 knockout. So now we have the, day, the neonatally thymectomized mice, we have the IL-2 knockout mice, we have the CTLA-4 knockout mice, all developing the same syndrome. A little bit difference in the kinetics and a little bit difference in the autoimmune phenomenon, but it was basically, for all intents and purposes, the same kind of thing. In 1991 through several years into 1996, Virginia Godfrey uh, did a series of experiments to try to understand what was going on with the so-called scurfy mouse. Now, the scurfy mouse would have the same sort of syndrome, immunodeficiency, and autoimmunity. She traced in her experiments uh, in the early 90s, she found that, that what was going on was is that these, these mice were becoming sick because they were getting activated T cells, CD4 activated T cells, and they were just spewing out all kinds of cytokines, <laughs> those nasty little molecules, you know? And, it was, and so it looked like the, the immune systems were hyperactive all the time, but at the same time, they, they were immunodeficient. And they would go on and, uh, and, and they would get scurfier and scurfier. I think they, somebody must have gotten their, their letters mixed up and it should have been scruffy. Anyway, they got scurfier and scurfier and then they would go on to die. In 95, the other thing that happened, so we have the scurfy mouse, the CTLA-4 knockout mouse, the IL-2 knockout mouse, the neonatally thymectomized mice all developing the same kind of a syndrome. In 1995, Sakaguchi published a paper in the Journal of Immunology uh, where he uh, was looking for a subset of T cells that would prevent this onset of this uh, inflammatory, auto-inflammatory immunodeficiency kind of syndrome in the neonatally thymectomized and also the nude mouse, um, the nude, nude uh, genotype. And he found that, and this is critical because now he found that the, the, if he took away uh, a subset of CD4 positive T cells, but also CD8 positive T cells, and that's very important that most people just ignore completely at this day and age. Uh, if, if he took away the IL-2 receptor positive cells, the alpha chain positive cells, then they, um, they'd get this disease. And if he put it back, he could prevent them from getting that disease. So that was really, really important because it gave the immunological community who would, by this time, 95, 96, they were, they were pretty hot on this whole thing. And, um, and because now it gave them a marker so that they could, they could use antibodies to the alpha chain, um, incidentally, which is also has a CD number, it's a cluster of uh, differentiation number 25. It's also really critical because of the fact that by really referring to this um, molecule, surface molecule on activated CD4 positive T cells, which is what, what we had originally uh, reported and thought it always was, was also present on the so-called suppressor cells um, or um, regulatory cells, a la Sakaguchi's uh, 82 paper. That's the background and the introduction of this paper. Sakaguchi's group uh, goes on to, to look at the, well, he points out that what happened in, in between 95 and 2003, when this paper came out, in 2001, people discovered a gene that was that encoded for a uh, forkhead winged uh, transcription factor called FOXP3, which was mutated in the scurfy mouse. And almost simultaneously, it was found to be mutated in humans, human, young baby babies born that had a severe auto-inflammatory immunodeficiency diseases. There were two different syndromes, but basically the same um, pathophysiology. Uh, one was uh, the is entitled or an acronym is IPEX, and the other one is. XLAAD, um, severe autoimmune disease, and also immunodeficiency. They yeah. both had mutations in FOXP3. So the stage was set to see whether or not there was a common molecular mechanism that was responsible for all of these different sy syndromes that seemingly had 
disparate um, uh, molecular mechanisms involved, but ending in the same phenotype, essentially. And so that brings us to the uh, results in this paper. And we should go on to screen sharing. So this is figure one um, of this paper that came out in Science in February of 2003. And the first thing they wanted to do was to see what the expression of FOXP3 was in subpopulations of CD4 positive T cells, both in the thymus and in the periphery. So the A uh, unit of this figure shows uh, fractionated thymocytes, double negatives, double positive, CDA positive, CD4 positive, and this is an RT-PCR for FOXP3. And you can see that FOXP3 is expressed, but only in CD4 positive cells. And then if you look at CD4 positive cells and separate them into, into alpha chain positive IL-2 receptor alpha chain, and I will try to refer to CD25, uh, as the alpha chain, just because I'm Kendall Smith. <laughs> so I'll, uh, alpha chain positive, negatives, alpha chain positive, and you can see that there is, here you see a, a sort of a slight band here um, in the FOXP3 positive end of things. Now, um, and that's in the thymus. And in the periphery, we're looking at um, uh, spinocytes or lymph node cells. B cells are negative, CD8 cells are negative for FOXP3. Uh, CD4 positive cells are positive, and most of the positivity is in the alpha chain positive uh, subset of that. And this is the uh, loading control here of HPRT. If you say to yourself, well, it doesn't look too impressive in terms of uh, the amount of positivity here, but if you normalize yeah. the uh, intensity uh, of, of these bands according to the HPRT bands, you find that um, the uh, C, and, you, and if you set the, the CD25 positive population at 100%, you find out that, and this is a logarithmic scale over here, uh, the, the total population um, is only 1%, uh, and so it, it's really uh, um, a marked increase in positivity of the, um, uh, the alpha chain positive cells. So going on to figure two then, what they did was they decided to see if they, if they transfected in the FOXP3 gene together with a, um, a marker gene, uh, green fluorescence protein, they could then follow what was going on in this whole situation. And so they, uh, they examined the retroviral transduction of FOXP3 into naive CD4 positive T cells to see whether or not they could make they could make these cells become regulatory T cells, both in genotype as well as phenotype, um, uh, and, and therefore become regulatory cells. And so this is the negative control with just the uh, GFP gene. And then this is the FOXP3. And then the internal um, site then going on to GFP. And you can see that um, when they are transfected and then activated to see whether or not these cells could proliferate, this is the um, fresh cells, not untransfected. This is the negative control, and this is the positive control. So you can see that proliferation is markedly diminished as is the, the uh, production of interleukin-2, interferon gamma, interleukin-4, and and uh, interleukin 10. So they could recapitulate the whole thing simply by making cells express FOXP3. So then moving on to figure three, the question was whether or not these um, cells that looked like had the genotype and also the phenotype of a regulatory cell, whether they could suppress the proliferation of other cells and this is the um, uh, one manifestation of, of that whole thing. This is activation of um, CD alpha chain negative CD4 positive cells by anti-CD3, and then culturing in vitro and looking at thymidine incorporation with increasing concentrations of uh, FOXP3 positive cells. And you can see that there is a suppressive activity uh, of, of this whole thing. Now, um, then moving on to Figure four, the question is whether or not these mice show evidences of um, deranged um, immunity so that what they tested for in, in these experiments where they transferred cells that were um, where they had transfected in the FOXP3 gene. And this is weeks after transfer. And these are these and, and looking at the body weight of after a few weeks of, of 
having these cells on board, these, these mice are starting to do poorly. And you can see this is the colon. They looked at the colon and the stomach to look for all sort of colitis-like uh, syndrome versus um, uh, gastritis here. And you can see here's the colon with the, the, in the CD25 negative cells. If you look at the, uh, the ones with FOXP3, you can see that they don't, uh, they're not developing their, their uh, colitis, whereas with the negative control, they do develop an infiltration of all these uh, positive cells. Same thing with in the stomach. And, um, and so that's the end of that. That's the end of this paper. And so uh, I can stop the screen sharing. In the discussion of this paper, the FOXP3 expression of only of less than 10% of the CD4 positive T cells in the periphery of normal mice um, is really marking the um, regulatory T cell subset. FOXP3 expression in, in naive cells by transfection is, is able to convert regulatory T cell genotype and phenotype and function in terms of inducing autoimmune and, and, and autoinflammatory kinds of uh, situations. Um, and so therefore, the, that supports the, the genetic data that if you have mutations in FOXP3 and you have therefore decreased regulatory T cells, that's why you're developing these uh, autoimmune diseases. Now, this is really the first <laughs> to my knowledge anyway, the first real um, molecular understanding of, of why uh, autoimmune, autoimmune and autoinflammatory diseases um, become uh, manifest. And, and basically what's going on is you're losing so-called peripheral tolerance. In other words, those cells that are not deleted in the thymus during um, T cell development because they're, they're autoreactive, some, some cells slip through that um, deletional mechanism and populate the periphery, and they, but they're kept suppressed in the periphery by regulatory T cells. And that's the, the bottom line there. Now, one thing that one point that Sakaguchi made in this um, science paper was that this FOXP3 is a better marker for identifying uh, regulatory T cells than is the IL2 receptor alpha chain. And the only problem was the FOXP3 was an internal protein uh -huh. gene product, was not expressed on the cell surface. So there was much more difficult to study uh, to separate positive, negative populations and, and so forth and so on. Now, subsequently, and we'll probably go into some of these papers in the Journal Club. Um, well, the first thing was within the next month, this came out in February of 03. In March of 03, two other papers came out in uh, Nature Immunology. One from Ramsdale's group who, uh, from Seattle, Washington, who uh, was uh, instrumental in, in defining the FOXP3 mutation in, in scurfy mice and also in humans. And then another one by uh, Alexander Rudensky from Seattle uh, that they basically said the same. These two papers said the same thing that Sakaguchi's paper did. So you might want to go read those just to see the different take on things at that point in time by these three different groups. Now, this, this, these papers uh, left a whole bunch of questions. I mean, that's why, why science is some, such a good thing. You solve one problem, you get a whole bunch of other ones that now you can work on those. <laughs> and so the, the first thing was, so what's the function of the FOXP3 Fox P3 gene? And subsequently, it was shown that it, working at the level of transcription blocked TCR activation of particularly the NFAT um, transcription factors, uh, which are necessary for ILD, IL-2 and other um, cytokines gene expression. So that, that came to pass. The other thing that was very interesting, at least from my standpoint, was the expression of FOXP3 was subsequently found to be induced by IL-2. That solidified in my mind the fact that what this FOXP3 is doing is that it's part of a negative feedback loop. And of course, that's the, the one criteria that we had been looking for since the early 80s to be able to say that, okay, what we're dealing with here in the immune system is a whole new uh, immune system, hormonal system. It's, this is just like endocrinology. 
And of course, most immunologists have never had it, of course, in, in endocrinology. And so they, whenever I would talk about that, they would, they wouldn't understand what I was, it was sort of like they were dog, they were dogs watching TV. They didn't really get it. That's the fact that this is, this is part of a feed, a negative feedback loop. So then the question is, well, how, what's the molecular mechanism um, of this uh, FOXP3, this regulatory T-cell phenomenon? And, and right, right away, immediately, people started saying, well, it's just a big IL-2 sink. It just, because the cells were IL-2 receptor positive, right? But of course, if they called it CD25, they didn't have to deal with any thoughts about what IL-2 might be doing in this particular system. But the naysayers at the time said, you know, it's just a big IL-2 sink, you know, so it's not, a, not such a big deal. But it is a big deal because it really places much more a continuing importance on, on the function of interleukin-2 in the, in, in the T-cell immune response. Mm -hmm. And in support of that, um, I, I went ahead and collaborated with Gregoire um, Altan Bonet, an uh, owner um, in Bayern, uh, who was at Sloan Kettering, and they were there. They had did a series of really nice experiments, a series of nice experiments um, showing that uh, the regulatory T cell, the the density of the alpha chain on regulatory T cells, was huge by comparison to CD8 cells or act, you know antigen activated cells or or E-factor CD4 positive T cells. And the consequence of that, and what they showed was, the consequence of that was, it really was a very efficient um, uh, grabber of uh, IL-2. And as soon as it would do that, it would internalize and IL-2 was, was degraded. And Pushpapandian and Mike Leonardo's lab uh, showed very nice experiments showing that when that happened, when you added um, regulatory T cells in, in with effector T cells, that the regulatory T cells would sop up all the IL-2 so that then what would happen was because of cytokine deprivation, the effector T cells would die uh, through apoptosis. Uh, and so that was at least uh, part of the story uh, as, as to how um, regulatory T cells regulate, but there's still more to come. And so I'll stop here. I don't want to give away the whole shebang all at once here. Uh, and um, don't forget to uh, like the video if you do and click on the bell and subscribe, check out the website and um, come back next week. Thanks. If you're new to immunology uh, or you just want to delve into a certain aspect of this uh, large field and you want to get a grasp on things, you should buy my new book, Molecular Immunity, because it's a chronology of all of the important experiments and discoveries that have been made uh, in the last 60 years. It's concise, but it's also very comprehensive. And it's the only such book that's been written uh, since 1970. So you can buy it on Amazon and together with the YouTube videos of the Classics and Immunology Journal Club, you can't go wrong.